Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back for another episode. You know, I have um, (laughs) podcast fodder that happens to me potentially every day. And this week I had a discussion with a vendor of mine that works for me several hours a week. And uh, it was actually quite interesting. I'm really, really happy with this person's work. And she's charged me the same hourly fee. Oh, it was about 18 months ago that she started working for me. And in the last 18 months, we've had a little inflation, right? Things are more expensive. And certainly we've had 10%, if not 15% cumulative over those 18 months. And she's still charging me the the same fee. And I know that, you know, her expenses are going up. Her living expenses are. And let's just say that uh, we have, uh, we've had 10% inflation. Well, $25 an hour, which is what she's charging me, 18 months ago, would you need $27.50 to be level today. to to be at the same purchasing power. So I thought I would have a discussion with her because it's important to me that people that work for me, vendors, employees, are paid fairly. And maybe I'll get into the emotional reasons for that. But I approached her, and this may have been a little sideways on my Heart, but I asked her, what are you charging new clients? And I knew that she had stopped taking new clients because she was so busy. She says, well, the last ones I took on, I charged 30 an hour. I said, now remind me, what, what are you charging me? She said, 25. So we, we started a discussion around that. And I said, well, maybe I should be paying $30 an hour. Have you, have you raised your current clients. Well, no. She says, you know, to go from 25 to 30, that's a, that's a big increase. I said, yeah, it is. That's 20%. She says, I just, I just don't know. And I asked her, what's your fear? What's your fear about raising your current clients? 20%. Well, that they'll leave me. I said, okay. Now you've stopped taking new clients, right? Yeah. And if they leave you, then you'll need to take take on new clients, right? Yeah. And you've got more people wanting your services and you have time to give. Is that right? Yeah. So what will you take those new clients on at? $30 an hour. Okay. So if you're going to raise my fees from 25 to 30, and if I am unhappy about that and want to go find somebody else, I'll have to pay him 30. Is that right? Yeah. And and you could kind of see the light bulb go on. (laughs) And I said, let's take this just a little bit further. Let's say you raise my fee to $35. Uh, My thought process might go like this. Well, I probably could find somebody else at 30, but I'm really, really happy with uh, her work. And I just, I don't want to go through the transition and the search. And I am so happy with what she does. I'll go ahead and pay the 35. And she was uh, (laughs) like, oh, really? (laughs) So, and then we got into talking about inflation and talking about recession and talking about stagflation. Because I said, well, actually, even though inflation has been 10%, the wage increase has not been 10%. 
And when prices are going up faster than wages, that isn't the, the word that we use for that stagflation. So we can't equate that just because prices are up 10%, that means that I'll get a 10% raise. But I said, in, in your case, market is $30. So even though you're raising me 20%, you're raising me up to market. And so she says, well, okay, well, I'll think about that and let you know. <laughs> I was like, well, how about, how about if I help you out and we just raise me to $30 uh, starting, starting uh, next pay period? You'd really be okay with that? Of course I'd be okay with that. So we finally agreed and, and my my wife is uh, uh, downstairs listening to this conversation because I work out of my home. And she's like, wow, they're having quite a conversation about this. And, and we agreed on a, uh, a higher uh, hourly rate. So that, that's kind of the impetus because I have a number of uh, financial therapy clients that are fee-for-service providers. And who, who make their living charging hourly rates. And this is an issue with almost every person, not, not, not everybody, but is the, the fear around raising fees. And I, I want to say right now, I'm not immune to it. I go through much of the same things. So that's what I wanted to talk about was what are the emotional underpinnings of this? Because you could say, well, Rick, financially, that's kind of dumb idea on your part to increase your costs when you weren't being asked. She hadn't asked you for a raise. And that's true. And in the short run, I would say that wasn't a smart financial decision. I could have gotten off probably for a number of months without an increase in costs. But I think it was actually a really smart, long-term financial decision. As I'm saying this, I think of uh, a couple of ways to that people approach an increase in salary, and, and one is to ask for it, and another one is to have a money script that says, well, they'll pay me what I'm worth. Now, not every employer is going to be concerned about that, is going to be concerned about keeping their employees and contractors at market. So it's an interesting dance, isn't it? That if you have an employer that's trying to, to pay the least amount possible to their employees versus an employer that's trying to pay market or even above market, and employees who will ask for a raise and employees who will never ask for a raise and just assuming what, what they're getting is what they are worth. Lots of money scripts there. So back to uh, this particular situation, like I said, I, I was really happy with her work and I wanted her to be happy when she was working for me and feel that she was being treated fairly. Now, I obviously set fees. I have one business, financial therapy business, where we work hourly. I have a financial planning firm where we work on a retainer. But I have worked when I've underbid a project or I haven't raised my fees or I didn't quote a job high enough. And while I typically enjoy working with almost all my clients, there can be this little niggling thought when you know you're below market, when you know you're undercharging, that I'm not respecting myself because the fee was so low. And now it took me years to figure out part of the issue was not respecting myself. But there is like there's a part of me going, hey, we're doing all this work. We're busting our butts and we're only getting this in payment when we're getting more than that for the same amount of work from others. So that, that's a, a bit of a projection on my part. My uh, contractor wasn't showing 
any sign of this. But it's really important to me that, like I said, employees and vendors feel honored, feel uh, respected in their wage because that's going to shine through in the work and especially if they're client facing to my clients. When I am underpaid, this niggling thought often will turn into resentment. And it's resentment that oftentimes isn't conscious. And resentment, and I should know about resentment, right? I'm an Enneagram type one. And the passion, the main, um, it's not a completely an emotion, but emotion of a type one is resentment. And that's anger, anger that's buried. It took me years of doing my own personal work to even be aware of my resentment. So, so not honoring yourself, not getting a wage that is market or that a person perceives is not market uh, can, can come out in resentment and resentment will come out in a behavior. And in the workplace, resentment could be apathy, not caring, uh, a lack of being cooperative, a low responsiveness, a drop in response ability, poor performance, just not really being engaged. So I just look at it as a real win-win for both the employer and the employee. If the, the wage is paid for the service, treat everyone fairly. I do take this pretty seriously. For example, in my financial planning firm, the, our profession gathers tons of data on what current compensation is. And in fact, when I'm working on setting uh, salaries, there's four different compensation studies I can go to to see what is average, what is median. So there's a lot of data, and that's what I rely on to make sure that uh, wages and salaries are set, set fairly. So that's, that's kind of the, the first thing to look at when, whether you're fee-for-service or you're an employee, there is a market rate for your services. So when I talk about raising fees, if you're in business for yourself, if you're, say, a therapist or any type of a, a, a someone who contracts at an hourly rate, you completely understand when I'm talking about raising your fees. However, if you're an employee, you rent your services out to your employer. Ultimately, you're in charge of the, the, of the wage that you agree to work for. So finding out what a fair wage is, what a fair fee is, is the first thing to do. If you're having these niggling thoughts that maybe you're underpaid, maybe you are and maybe you're not. So this is a case where we need to take a look at the facts. And of course, this is my logic part coming out because if I am feeling um, angry, resentful because I don't think I'm being paid enough, and that's coming out in my behavior, it will be helpful for me to know what the going wage is. And sometimes I run into this where a person thinks they're being underpaid. But when you really take a look at the marketplace, it's fair. Um, and the marketplace doesn't care. Uh, market is market. For example, Let's take teachers and let's take professional athletes. How many times do we go, wow, what, <laughs> what is wrong with our society? That we will pay somebody that can hit a baseball or <clears throat> catch a football millions of dollars a year. And yet teachers, I don't know what the average wage is in South Dakota, but it might be 45000 a year. And how important a teacher is in the life of somebody. Uh, certainly, teachers are worth more. Now, it, philosophically, that is absolutely true. However, the marketplace says differently. 
the marketplace, it's pretty easy to figure out what the, the median rate, the going rate for a teacher is and what the going rate for a professional athlete is. And our society puts a much higher value on that professional athlete than a teacher. And we can argue that that's, that's not good priorities. But nevertheless, if you're a teacher and you want millions of a year to be equal to a professional athlete, that just isn't going to happen. So that's why getting the facts, getting what, what is normal, what is a median amount that somebody that does what I do gets is really hard, is really important. Because then if that is lower than what we think we're worth, we need to do some work on what's going on internally, what's going on within me, where I don't feel valued. What's it mean when the marketplace is saying this is my value and internally I'm not responding well to that? So <laughs> like about everything, it's not about the money, right? It's not hard to figure out what your services are worth doing certain tasks. I mean, for example, when I mow my yard, I don't know what the going rate is for mowing around here. Let, let's say it's $35 or $40. So I'm earning, let's just say $35 an hour when I mow my yard. When I am doing financial therapy, uh, I'm closer to uh, 250 to 300 an hour. And when I'm doing specific financial counseling, yellow pad financial planning, it's 750 to 1,000 an hour. So nobody's going to pay me 1,000 bucks to mow their lawn. <laughs> and I'd be crazy to go do some intense financial consulting, bringing 40 years of experience to the table for $35. And that has nothing to do with, with what my worth is as a human, as a person. And yet, it can get kind of tangled up and complex. So, find out what you're worth in the service that you're providing. If that service, if it's not paying enough, and you actually need more to make ends meet, then we need to look at some re-education. We need to look at doing a different job, doing something differently. Rather than parts of us being upset or mad, at our employer because as a say a worker at McDonald's in Rapid City I think you get 17 18 dollars an hour if that's not enough then I need to find a niche some service that I can provide where it is valued at more so that's one of the first things to do when you're uh, looking at what should I be charging what's a reasonable fee for what I'm doing Another thing to do is to consider your experience. Just because another vendor is charging more or less than you are doesn't mean that the market rate for you should be equal to that. If the other person you're comparing yourself to is more experienced, more years, more training, well, then it makes sense that your rate would be less and vice versa. Same would be true if they're less experienced in charging uh, a fee that for you charging more may be perfectly honoring and reasonable. Here's where we get tripped up and I see this in a lot of clients when we're talking about charging fees and that's being aware of fear-based self-talk, right? And this is something I can totally relate to. Thinking of, well, if I, if I raise my fee what will my clients think about me? Will they think that I'm greedy? Will they drop my services? Am I better off accepting the current wage than them firing me? And then, then possibly nobody's going to hire me at the higher fee. <clears throat> and maybe I better take the, the bird in hand that I have. And even if they stay on as a client, <clears throat> will raising my fee anger them and change our relationship. And these were all things that my vendor was going through and thinking as we talked. Now, here I am on the other side, not thinking that at all. Like, oh, I, I really want you to be happy. 
I want to retain you. So she's wanting to retain me and fearful I'll drop her. And I'm wanting to retain her and fearful that she might drop me if I don't pay more. <laughs> these, are, these are so normal to go through these fears and this resistance around raising a, uh, a fee. So I say that because it's important not to criticize yourself for wanting to raise your fee and especially wanting to raise your fee up to, to market. Then other critics will come in, you know, and say, who do you think you are? You're not worth it. Um, I mean, all sorts of parts can be um, giving these messages off and they all have good intentions, right? They all have good intentions. But at the, at the base of this fear, typically is a fear of being rejected, abandoned, uh, anxiety, and financial insecurity <clears throat> that I'll go broke. If I raise my fees, nobody will, will hire me. So those are things to, to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, another thing is when you're looking at raising fees on existing clients, one thing we can do to kind of help these vulnerable parts of ourselves out is first, raise your fee to new clients first. That's easy because they're not existing. And then we can give notice to existing clients that at some date in the future, I'm going to be raising fees, gives a chance to let them know why, uh, gives them a chance to internalize this so it's not a surprise, and allows a client to, to voice any objections or fears over the, the increase that maybe you can help them with or help them get over or give them data, give them facts that, well, here's what the market is. Because they need to be, may need to be educated uh, to the fact that, oh, if I went out and hired this, I'd pay how much? I mean, how many times have you heard somebody, an employee will quit or, or an employer wouldn't give an employee a raise? And then they go out and they end up paying even more for the new employee, the raise that was requested by the old employee that quit. It happens a lot. So gives you a chance to give them more information. And sometimes, if you know, it's really possible that you, you lose a customer or an employer won't match the wage you're asking for. And again, we're going under the assumption that what you're asking for is market, which means you could go out and get that same fee from somebody else. And so if somebody doesn't retain you, the reasons may not have anything to do with you. Uh, maybe they're already financially stressed. Maybe they couldn't, oh, they could barely afford you before. And now at at market, they just can't keep up. They just can't pay that. Uh, your services may be a luxury that they can't afford. And then again, it's possible that they're just not finding value in your services and they are on the cusp of dropping your services anyway, which <laughs> can, kind of, can kind of kick up those parts of us. And that's what they were afraid of. And the bottom line is keeping your wage at market rate is respect respecting yourself. If we are working for less than what is market, it's a form of abandoning ourselves. And if you like your work, keeping your, your rate at market will assure that you show up fully for your customers and clients, right? Because you're being honored, you're being paid market. And that will ultimately result in a happier client when you're fully showing up. And if you're an employer, the same is true for your employees or your contractors. By paying them a fair market wage is going to result in them being happier. And if you, as an employer, have happy contractors and happy employees, that's going to translate to happier customers and clients. And ultimately, a more sustainable business, a more profitable business, and a culture that people are attracted to. 
So I really look at uh, paying a fair, a fair market wage as a win-win for everybody. So I could get into what happens when you're paying above market wage. I had a, an employee once tell me, don't ever do that again because I was paying her higher than market. But I'm out of time. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this and some of the emotions that surround that. And uh, I look forward to talking with you again next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.